Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you here on our third uh, day of Holy Week services, and we're glad that you've taken the time to be here, and uh, we know that uh, you will uh, receive a blessing by being here. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we will get into worship. Lord, uh, we praise you and thank you for this day that you brought us to uh, celebrate your goodness, to, uh, to commemorate once again that last week that you spent here on earth and the plethora of emotions that you went through on our behalf. I pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us who are gathered here this afternoon. Particularly, we pray that you would uh, empower Patty today as she brings the message that you've laid upon her heart. Uh, may it be a word that uh, blesses our souls and encourages us to live a life of a greater faithfulness toward you and toward your church. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. No sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The Amba king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. A Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Thank you to Crystal. Parker was supposed to sing for us today, but he is not feeling well, so she left her class for just a few minutes to come over here and sing for us, and so now she's um, having to rush back to Stone Memorial. But um, thank you, Crystal. It was lovely. Let's continue worshiping by singing hymn number 287, O Love Divine, What Hast Thou Done?
Good afternoon, my name is Patty Huey, and I am a Stephen leader in the Stephen ministry, and we're leading the messages this week. I thank you all for being here. Today I wanted to talk about community. Um, we hear a lot about community. We hear a lot about anti-community. Somebody's always bashing somebody on social media. Um, the back and forth, the intolerance, and we think, what has this world come to? This is horrible. What, what is happening to us? But I want to tell you, we are no more or no less sinful than those back in Jesus' time. History repeats itself. And so I had an exercise in a class I took um, a couple, well, maybe four years ago. And one of the things was about fleshing out Bible verses. And this appealed to me because the whole idea of being a storyteller appeals to me and using my imagination. So my scripture today is John chapter 12, and it's 1 through 7. Six days before Passover, Jesus went back to Bethany, where he had raised Lazarus from death. A meal had been prepared for Jesus. Martha was doing the serving, and Lazarus himself was there. Mary took a very expensive bottle of perfume and poured it on Jesus' feet. She wiped them with her hair, and the sweet smell of the perfume filled the house. A disciple named Judas Iscariot was there, and he was the one who was going to betray Jesus. And he asked, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? Judas did not really care for the poor. He asked this because he carried the money bag and sometimes would steal from it. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She has kept this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you you won't always have me. Now, when I was a kid, I just, you know, the disciples were elevated in my mind. They were special people. And I didn't really get um, just how wrong they could be, even after seeing miracle after miracle. And I think this says a lot about us as people. Um, we, community is so important to us. And Jesus held it as, as important because he encouraged his disciples to live in it with him. It's easy for us to get offended and afraid because we think nothing else has happened like this before, and we're the first ones to experience anything negative, but it's far from the truth. Now, I'm gonna take an imaginative turn through John 12, those first seven verses. Jesus and his disciples have come to a special dinner party hosted by Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary. Lazarus reclines with Jesus his special honored guest on cushions before a low dining table. Scattered about are the disciples in groups of two or three, talking in low tones amongst themselves. Martha is in the kitchen preparing the meal. Mary wanders about the great room, her focus on Jesus, and she is thinking about the wondrous gift she plans to give Jesus tonight. And she's very excited and nervous. Martha, in contrast, is filled with pride for the meal she is preparing for the honored guest. She's also annoyed with Mary, who once again is not helping her very much, but she won't say anything because the last time she said anything, Jesus rebuked her. Lazarus is in a comfortable conversation with Jesus, but he's distracted from time to time with thoughts about how he had died but then was brought back to life by the man sitting right next to him. Lazarus also pushes back memories of that time 
There's images of things he doesn't understand, and those images disturb him. Mary brings out her gift of fragrant oil and anoints Jesus' head and feet and then nervously takes down her hair in front of a room full of men who were not related to her, a blatantly intimate act, usually between a husband and a wife, and then in an exponentially more intimate act, wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, wipes them clean of dirt, sweat, and excess oil with her hair. The disciples are gobsmacked, as well as Lazarus and Martha. All are uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable. What are they witnessing? Only Judas speaks up. He is jealous of Mary's devotion. He questions her gift self-righteously, asserting how the cost of such a gift could benefit the poor if put into the disciples' fund. Of course, Judas is, is in charge of that fund, of disbursements from it, and he is calculating how much of the cost of that oil he could embezzle. For the first time all evening, Peter is jolted from his jealousy of Lazarus spending, spending time one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. Peter longs to be the one at Jesus' side and in front of everyone else. He has spent all evening receiving what he thinks are smirking looks from the other disciples because, once again, Peter is not the right hand of Jesus. He regrets bringing his status up so often with the other disciples. Jesus certainly doesn't honor Peter's status tonight. Whatever the other disciples had been talking about earlier is blasted from their minds when smelling the sweet scent of the oil that Mary anoints Jesus with. They look up to see her taking down her hair. They've all thought that Mary is secretly in love with Jesus. Jesus speaks too intimately with her. She is so impulsive and most think she's in love with Jesus and would marry him if he asked. When Judas speaks out, they smirk to themselves because his thievery is common knowledge. Each of them are secretly glad when Judas is rebuked and relieved that they didn't speak out against Mary first. Jesus' rebukes can pierce you to the soul. They don't really process Jesus' words about his upcoming death. Seriously, after all, he's healthy, he's hearty. And then we come to Jesus. You know, if Jesus was a teenager nowadays, he might have just died from eye rolling. Um, <laughs> I can imagine if that was a cultural thing that that would have been a temptation to roll your eyes at everything that was said around you. Jesus knows his words are falling on deaf ears. They hear, but they don't listen. Each caught up in their own selves. He sighs and prays silently for all of them, for all of us who follow. I don't think a community nowadays is really very different from a community back in the day. Sometimes we're a good community, sometimes we fail horribly. Sometimes we spend time just voicing our, our unhappiness that others don't think like we do. But we are encouraged to be in community. In Hebrews, well, well, lost my place here. There it is. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25, we should keep on encouraging each other to be thoughtful and to do helpful things. Some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship. 
Is that not true about today? But we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. And look, I know we have been isolated for the pandemic, for a time during the end the pandemic, and one gets used to being by oneself, doesn't, don't you? And sometimes being in communities can be uncomfortable. I mean, people say the most annoying things. And sometimes when we're isolated and then we're hearing all the negativity on news feeds, we further isolate our inner selves. Now, um, I remember the first time I came back for a small group for choir, it was the first time we were back singing, just a few of us, because we were all spaced and masked and everything. And I, I live alone. I have cats, I have a dog, my dog does not bark. So there's not just like a great deal of loud noise in the house that I get into. So I come a little early and I come up here and Georgiana's playing the organ. And I'm like, sheesh, my goodness, why is the organ so loud? I actually had to go down and sit by the pew until I realized I just wasn't, I wasn't used to it. But we should not, I stuck it out and I'm used to it again. I love the organ, but we shouldn't let all those things that we've become accustomed to over our time apart be what drives us forward. We need to be together and we need to reach out within the community. We need to, that community is what sharpens our faith, deepens our faith, and in return, we do the same for others. Community is difficult, but it's what Jesus wanted us to be in. He didn't encourage us to all go be hermits, to stay away. Just find it easier not to get up and go. Goodness knows, that's been my, my struggle many times. The other day I was visiting my grandson and I found, it was the front of a greeting card that my daughter-in-law had put up on the refrigerator and it was called How to Build Community. And I thought, wow, this is really appropriate for next week. It says, turn off your TV, leave your house, know your neighbors, greet people, look up when you're walking, sit on your stoop, plant flowers, use your library, play together, buy from local merchants, share what you have, help a lost dog, take children to the park, honor elders, support neighborhood schools, fix it even if you didn't break it. Have potlucks, garden together, pick up litter, read stories aloud, dance in the street, talk to the mail carrier, listen to the birds, put up a swing, help carry something heavy, barter for your goods, start a tradition, ask a question, hire young people for odd jobs, organize a block party, bake extra and share, ask for help when you need it, open your shade, sing together, share your skills, take back the night, and I love these two, turn up the music, turn down the music. Listen before you react to anger, mediate conflict, seek to understand, learn from new and uncomfortable angles, Know that no one is silent, though many are not heard, and work to change this. In the last couple of years, well, really, for the last five years, my community has meant so much for, to me. Y'all have helped me when I was at my lowest, 
You built me up. You carried me. And you did it really without even thinking about it. You just reached out. And it built in me a need to reach out to and, and to see that our connections to each other are more important than most of the things I think are important in my life. I'm trying to change my mindset. I'm working hard on it. I hope that um, each one of you will reach out today, even smiling at a stranger. I know many of you do all these things already, and you are a, you are such an example to me and others. I love you each and every one of you, even though I don't know you. Many of you, I love you. And it's only through Jesus. Now, I was going to sing a little, I was going to sing your blessing. And it's an old song I used to sing with the kids. And in it, trees clap their hands, which seems strange, but I love the idea. You shall go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands as you go out with joy. Lord, prepare us for this next, the next day. Prepare us for the rest of the day. Be with us 24-7. Um, let us be mindful of our thoughts and words and of your love as it flows through us. Keep us where you can use us. In Jesus' name, amen.